As has already been said, the simple translation of the value, or respectively, of the price of labor power into the exoteric forms of wages transforms all these laws into laws of the fluctuation of wages. That which appears in these fluctuation of wages within a single country as a series of varying combinations may appear in different countries as contemporaneous difference of national wages. In this short chapter, Marx briefly examines how and why wages vary in different countries and highlights capitalism's uneven geographical development. He argues that when examining the difference in wages across countries, certain factors must be taken in mind, such as the price and extent of the necessities of life and their natural and historical development. That is, the prices and availability of all the things that are necessary for laborers to sustain themselves. However, we must consider why these things are priced as they are and why they are available. We must look at their natural development, the climate, fertility of the soil, etc. But we must also look at the historical development of the class struggles that have led to these prices. The cost of training workers, which depends entirely on what roles the workers are being trained to do and their relationship to production. If we put this into context with colonial history and the present day, we can observe a worldwide division of labour. In colonised countries that have been used for their raw materials for capitalism's development, the labour force is largely made up of mining and agricultural workers that require little to no training or education. However, in so-called developed countries, where these raw materials become transformed into commodities, we see much more specialised roles throughout the labour force that require more training and education, and so higher costs for that training. The part played by labour of women and children. As we saw in chapter 10, women and children have been used as cheap labour throughout capitalism's development. This was largely a tactic used as a way of undermining the cost of higher paid wages of the male workforce and to drive down the prices of wages in general. The productivity of labour and its extensive and intensive magnitude. We saw from part 4 of Capital onwards how increases in the productivity and intensity of labour lowers the value of the necessary commodities needed for the labourer's own reproduction. This, in its price form, obviously means a market of cheaper priced commodities and less wages required to purchase those commodities. We should also take into account how these factors are developed and used. For example, in some parts of the world, productivity and intensity may be technologically driven by machinery, and in other parts of the world may be instead driven by such things as peace wages discussed in the previous chapter. We must also examine how the class relations and class struggles have also shaped how much of a share the labourers received in context towards increasing productivity, as we discussed in chapter 17. Marx argues that by observing these factors, we can see a worldwide hierarchical scale of different countries' productivity and wage levels. He also very briefly mentions how countries utilise foreign investment by either importing lower wage labourers from one country to their own, or a country can move some parts of its production to another country that has a lower waged workforce. However, we have to remember that the production of surplus value does not rely on absolute wage levels. That is, capital doesn't require absolute low wages. It relies on the rate of surplus value and the rate of exploitation. It is certainly possible for a lower rate of exploitation in a country that has lower wages, just as it is possible for a higher exploitation rate in a country with higher wages. In proportion as capitalist production is developed in a country, in the same proportion do the national intensity and productivity of labour there rise above the international level. The different quantities of commodities of the same kind 
produced in different countries in the same working time have therefore unequal international values, which are expressed in different prices, i.e. in sums of money varying according to international values. The relative value of money will, therefore, be less in the nation with more developed capitalist modes of production than in the nation with less developed. It follows, then, that the nominal wages, the equivalent of labour power expressed in money, will also be higher in the first nation than in the second, which does not at all prove that this holds also for the real wages, i.e. for the means of subsistence placed at the disposal of the labourer.